Good morning again. Compromise, depending on its context, can be a dirty word, right? When we are talking about trying to decide a course of action, it's a necessity. Compromise is a necessity. But when it comes to our character and our moral choices, compromise becomes a dirty word, right? When it comes to our character and our integrity and our morality, if we give sin an inch, it becomes our ruler. You can thank J.D. Greer for that quote. I loved it. Um, we're diving into this book, and this book is like, it could be an Avengers movie. As you read through it, it is all action. It is battle. It is war. Um, and there is so much in it. Um, this morning, we're going to focus on compromise. Uh, we're going to look at that. How many of you have ever been hiking? We're Colorado. We're a fitness state. We love our hiking, right? Good handful of us. How many of you hike alone? Oh, look at all the good hikers in here that know you're always supposed to go with somebody. What happens if you hike alone? You die. You can die. Yeah. Why? What's something that typically happens? Bears and lightning, not what I was thinking. Wow, that was really specific. They go hiking and they go hide under the trees, get hit by lightning and the tree falls on them. Not what I was thinking. How about getting lost? How many times throughout the summer do we hear people getting lost all the time in our mountains? And having been a Boy Scout and spent years in the woods every summer, it's so easy to all of a sudden not know where you're at, right? That's why we go with other people so that when you're walking down the trail and you go off for a second, Hopefully, somebody knows where you went, right? So they come looking for you. Does anybody know the first rule if you're lost, what you do? Yeah, go ahead. Call for help? No. <laughs> A compass? Yes, that would help you. Mona? Stay where you are. That's what I was thinking of. Those are good answers, but stay where you are. Why? because you'll get farther and further away from where you want to be, right? When we're lost, stop. You think about it, and hopefully you can retrace your steps. Or you stay right there if you can't recognize where you are and you wait for rescue, right? In our book this morning, that is not what the Israelites did. They did not stop. Um, this idea of compromise, of making small choices that lead us down a large path with dark consequences defines this book of Judges, right? If you're at all familiar with it, it's the common refrain throughout the book is everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, not what was right in God's eyes. They didn't have a unified vision for what God wanted. They just did what they thought was best. Guess who is a bad judge of right and wrong? We are, right? We're really bad at judging right and wrong on our own in our human brokenness. We have wayward hearts that steer us in all the wrong directions, all the time. Contrary to what Disney tells us, chasing after our heart will only lead to heartbreak, right? Because our hearts are deceitful. That's what scripture tells us. Now we can have a new heart that can lead us to all the things that God wants us to have, but it has him at the center with him as the judge of right and wrong, right? Because as a human, I am flawed and I am feckless. We'll get to that word in a minute. The book of Judges reveals humanity for what we are. We're wayward, selfish creatures. We're feckless. If you're not familiar with uh, that word, it's defined this way. Being weak in character. Lacking strength of character. Being irresponsible. Incompetent. Ineffective, futile, lacking in determination. On our own, that is who we are as humans. That is our sinful state. I thought it defines it very well. God's faithfulness and human fecklessness is what will be the defining feature of this book. God is always faithful, and we are wayward people in desperate need of him, right? 
And what we'll see is this cycle that repeats throughout the book. Israel turns away from God. They make that one bad choice to step off the trail, but they don't stop. They keep going. And so God withdraws his presence because they've turned their back on him. They fall into idolatry. God lets their enemies come and take their, take their land, invade and conquer them and rule over them. And then once they realize, oh no, we're in trouble and I've gone five miles off the trail and I'm going to die. And I cry out for help finally, right? What I should have done first, stop and wait for help, right? They cry out for help. God hears, he has pity on them because he loves us and he's merciful and he raises up a judge. And a judge is a warrior prophet. And that leader comes and leads Israel back to God and pushes out the enemy. And they do really good, usually. Well, at least in the beginning of the book, following the the judge and following God until they die. And then guess what? It starts all over again because we're wayward. And if we don't have God at the center of us, we stray off course. So that's what this book will show us. As we go week by week, we're going to not just have that same story again, but we will see that story played out. There are other things we learn from this book, but this is the overarching message that we can't do it on our own and that God will pursue us when we can't do it on our own. In addition to this repeated waywardness of God's people, we'll see that judges, not all the judges, not all of them were great examples. In fact, we start off with really good judges and then they're okay. And then by the end, they're not so good. They're, They're not much better than the people they're leading, right? But God still raised them up and uses them, right? In fact, the further we go, the worse they get. But God is still faithful to his promise. Now, the other thing you need to remember when we read this book is that it draws on the promises to Abraham, the Exodus story, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? All of those books are in mind as we read this narrative, and even Joshua, right? The conquest of the promised land. So I'm not going to tell you to read all of those because we're already going to be taking big chunks of scripture this week, uh, each week, but I'm going to encourage you to read the big chunks of scripture that we're going to skip through each week during this series, because it's a lot. And it's, like I said, it's an action story. And there's some really great things in the text that we just can't go over everything. Um, as we read Judges, we're going to arrive at two conclusions. Number one, that people are naturally inclined to be wayward. And there is a desperate need for a better leader. And another phrase you're going to pick up on as we read is that there was no king in Israel at that time. This refrain of there was no king, right? The leaders are imperfect. There was no perfect king. There was nobody to lead them properly. Now we know who is the king that we need. Jesus. Yeah, the perfect the perfect answer for Sabbath school, right? Jesus. Yeah, that's what this book is pointing to is that we need that perfect king, God's king, God's Messiah. And then the other conclusion is that it is only uh, God that can do these things. I see many of you don't have your Bibles in your lap. Shame on you. I'm going to invite you to grab your Bibles and open them back up to the book of Judges. Um, We're going to be in chapter one. We're going to go from chapter one to three, six today. So like I said, large chunk of text today, right? Don't worry, I won't read it all. I am going to do poorly on the names, not nearly as good as Sherry did. So bear with me on that. Like I said, throughout the series, we're going to speed through these chapters, not because they're not important, but because just for practicality, we can't go verse by verse through this much text. So please, please, please read all of God's counsel in between each week. So this week, you can read this whole chunk for yourself, okay? Um, There is one thing that I want to point out that you have to know and understand as we read through Judges, and that's a concept, a Hebrew concept of harem. Okay, and this is where we see that they, God told them to devote things to destruction, right? If you remember in the conquest, he said, don't take the plunder of the city. Instead, do this with it. The gold, melt it down and put it in the treasury. The people, you need to kill them all, right? And that doesn't sit well with us, right? That's harsh, right? It talks about killing entire cities. 
And this is an action story. It talks about these things too. I mean, we just read about thumbs and toes getting cut off. It's brutal, right? There's a point. If you remember back in Genesis when God's talking to Abraham and he says, you're going to inherit this land. He said, but not yet. Your descendants are going to go into captivity for 400 years and then I will bring them out into the land. But it's not going to happen now because the land, the people dwelling in that land have not reached the height of their sin. In other words, they haven't had every opportunity to turn away from their sin and the judgment, the time for judgment is not yet. So God is using the Israelites to judge the people of Canaan as he promises this land to people. So if it were me saying we should go slaughter the entire city, that would be wrong, right? Because I don't have pure motives. I'm not a good judge, but God knows best. And when God says it's time for judgment, everything God does is right. He's righteous. So as much as it doesn't sit well with us, remember when you go, I don't understand God's character in this moment, understand that this is judgment. And this is that concept of harem. And it's because as we'll see, if they didn't do these things, it's going to trap them later by not destroying all the idols, by keeping the treasure, by letting people live and enslaving them instead of driving them out, right? God didn't want them all to die. He wanted to drive them out of the land. So by slaughtering a city, hopefully everybody else flees, right? But it was judgment upon these nations. Just remember, God is judging because of their sin. And that's what we all deserve. So it's a hard concept. It's harsh. It doesn't sit well with our modern sensibilities. And yet it's God's command and God doing it. So I trust God and I know God's character. Therefore, I know God is righteous and I can accept these things. Even if I don't, it doesn't sit well with me, right? Okay, enough of that. Let's, uh, let's get into our Bibles that I hopefully, some of you have already closed them. Open them back up. No, just kidding. Um, So I had Sherry read verses 1 through 18. I will not reread those. But as we listen to it, I hope you noticed through the text that God had, the the people had come to God and they, they said, what are we, who's supposed to go and fight for the remainder of the land? Who's supposed to go out next? And God tells them, and they did it. They did what God said, right? The first 18 verses is about all these battles that they're winning and all the things that were being given because they were being obedient. They're winning the battles and the people are being driven out. But as we pick up in verse 19, things start to go sideways. So verse 19, it says, and the Lord was with Judah. So these are the ones that went in first to fight and took possession of the hill country But Judah could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Now raise your hand and tell me if you think that chariots of iron can stop God from accomplishing something. Wow, no hands. We we all know that that's an excuse, right? We see it for what it is. It's an excuse. We're not going to go there because they have chariots, which to be fair, that would be like telling me to go assault a hill with tanks on it. I get it. You either know that God has promised you these things or you didn't. And they started to not trust in what God had told them to do. So verse 21, we're going to skip down a little bit. It said, but the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Jerusalem to this day. Then we're going to skip down to 23. It says, and the house of Joseph scouted out Bethel. Now the name of the city was formerly Luz. And the spies saw a man coming out of the city and they said to him, please show us the way into the city and we will deal kindly with you. And he showed them the way into the city and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let that man and all his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites and built a city and its name is called Luz. And that, na- that, and that is its name to this day. That city becomes a problem later for the Israelites. 28, when Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nehalah. So the Canaanites lived among them, but became the subject to forced labor. You guys see a pattern going on in our text? The first first 18 verses were all about obedience. We were doing the things that God had told them to do. 
And then we couldn't conquer them because they had chariots. And then we decided to talk to this spy and we let him go because he helped us out. Specifically against what God had told them to do. And then that man goes to another nation, founds a city state, and that becomes a problem for Israel later. Instead of driving out the Canaanites, it says they were stubborn. God, we couldn't drive them out because they were stubborn. So we put them to forced labor. We made them slaves. That's good enough, right? I kind of did what you said. That's good enough. And so it continues on and on throughout the rest of the chapter. You see failure after failure to do the things that God had said for them to do before they went to conquest, right? They didn't drive out the people. They instead let them remain. So as we move into chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Now the angel of the Lord, that's a name typically meaning God, so God went up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the land that I swore to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns and your sides and their God shall become a snare to you. And as soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. They wept. So God goes across the entire land, reminds them of all the things he's done for them, all the times he delivered them and the things he called them to. And then he tells them, you have disobeyed me. Partial obedience isn't good enough. Not going there because you didn't want to doesn't cut it. Because you didn't do what he commanded, because they compromised and they didn't obey, there would be consequences and these people would become a trap for them. And the people wept. They were sad. They were distressed. But what doesn't it say they did? They didn't repent. They didn't change their actions. It says they wept. We can be sorry for the things we've done, but that doesn't mean we've turned away from them either right? We can be snared by them and we can let those things cause us great pain in our life until we're ready to turn away from them. So we're going to skip down again to verse 10. It says, and all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. So it says that Joshua died. He was leading the conquest. And then that entire generation that helped with the conquest died. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Sorry, I promised somebody I would call them and I just remembered. Bear with me one second. Okay, there we go. Sorry, they served the Baals and they abandoned the Lord and the God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods and from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. So they started worshiping other gods. They went into idolatry. Verse 15, it said, whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm as the Lord had warned and the Lord had sworn to do to them. And they were in terrible distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods and serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, because this people have transgressed my covenant, 
that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice. I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the ways of the Lord as their fathers did or did not, as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Verse uh, one of chapter three. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people Israel, that the people of Israel might know war to teach the war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five Lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Haramon, as far as Lebo Hamath. They were for testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of God, which he commanded by their fathers, by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel loved, lived among the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and their daughters took to themselves and their daughters, they took to themselves for wives and their own daughters, they gave to their sons and they served their gods. Whew. That was a big chunk of text. As you can see, it's sprinkled, not sprinkled, it's slathered in failure, right? Failure to comply, failure to listen, and it's peppered in compromise. So as we read it, what can we learn from it? If you're going to remember one thing this morning, it's a long phrase, but I want you to remember this. In our faith journey with Jesus, we need to remember that small disobedience can lead to big consequences but God is always pursuing us even in our waywardness. So our natural bend is self-reliance and selfishness, right? And that leads us to bondage. It's what we see happen to them. They make small compromises. I'm not going to conquer them because they have chariots. And it ends with them having to deal with being ruled over and, and not finishing the conquest. This is no news here, right? It's not new to us to know that people are wayward, that we choose things that are not for us. But man, I don't know. This text just reminds me and over and over again, just how wayward we are. I can look at them and say, oh, dumb people. But I'm really saying, oh, dumb me, because I'm them people, right? I think we can all acknowledge that as we read this. See, God's people constantly are turning away from him all through the Old Testament. And I don't think it stopped at the Old Testament. God just is, uh, he gave us Jesus and the spirit to help us not do those things today, right? And it doesn't mean that we don't do those things today, but we have the ability that they didn't have because we have the spirit dwelling in us. So we see them constantly falling and up, failing to uphold the covenant. And it becomes quite obvious that we as people can't save ourselves, right? It's kind of the point. It's why we need Jesus because we can't uphold those covenants because we're wayward in our hearts, right? Now, like I said, we, we of course are under grace. We have Jesus and we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, um, which helps us as committed followers of Jesus to be able to not be enslaved to sin. We can make those choices to turn away from those things. But let us not forget when we fail, to listen to the Spirit's guiding, we fall right back into our old nature, right? Paul talks about in the New Testament, putting on our new selves. He talks about putting it on like a robe. Well, when we hear the voice of God telling us to do something, whispering in your ear, hey, I want you to go talk to that person. And we don't, we're stripping off that robe of newness and being in our old self-glory, right? That's we are putting on the old man, as Paul would say, instead of putting on the new creation that we are. Do we strive to live in obedience because of fear or punishment? No. We have Jesus. We know that there is no fear, no condemnation for those who love him, right? We strive to serve and obey because we love him. And we want to be uh, living in the ways that he lived and has called us to live obedience and life change comes from our desire to be closer with Jesus and our love for him, right? So 
God is faithful even when we're feckless, right? That's the other thing I saw this morning as we looked through the text. And perhaps it's less obvious in these introductory chapters of Judges. But God doesn't abandon his people, even though they've abandoned him. While sin separates people from God, and he withdraws his presence, his his blessing over them. In fact, he's against them when they go out because they turned away from him. He is standing right there waiting for them to cry out to him. To have pity upon them when they've reached the height, the bottom of the barrel, when they've come to their end and realize, I'm in trouble, right? God's standing right there waiting. And what does he do? He raises up a judge. We read that God promises in scripture to give this land to his people, that he loves his people, that he wants good things for his people. Well, God doesn't go back on his promises. And that's what we see throughout the book is that as much as these people hurt God and as much as they turn away from God, God is still faithful in those promises he made, right? How many times do we tell him, nah, I'm not going to do that? You ever had those moments where you know the Holy Spirit was asking you to do something and you chickened out? You didn't have the courage. You said, no, God, they have chariots. I can't do it. Sorry. I couldn't drive them out because they were stubborn. I couldn't go talk to that person because they scare me, right? We come up with all sorts of excuses. When we forget we have a God who is able to do all the things and can intercede in every situation, we find our excuses to be feckless and low in character and fail God. And yet he still loves us in the midst of that and wants us to grow and be better. The last thing I saw this morning is that spiritual amnesia leads to apostasy. Spiritual amnesia. And again, I'm going to give credit to J.D. Greer. I loved this point that he made when I was reading through things. Uh, So this is his point, but I see it as well. Um, You see that this new generation is raised up who doesn't know. And that word know is the same word to know your wife or to know intimately things, right? So it's a personal knowledge, not a factual knowledge. It's a personal knowledge of something. They didn't know what God had done for them. So they knew. I mean, we all assume that they heard the stories. I mean, they were still serving God in the temple. They were celebrating the holidays. They were doing these things, right? So we know they knew, but they didn't know God in that way that the other generations did, right? And what did it lead them to do? It leaded them to, it it leaded, it led them to not trust God, right? I don't know that he'll show up for me like he did for them in Egypt, So I'm not going to go over there where they have those chariots, right? I'm not going to do those things. So when we fail to remember what God has done for us, we tend to choose the wrong things because we don't trust that he'll come through. And I'm going to speak out of personal experience. I shared with you guys my call to church planning. I'm terrified of that. I've shared that with you guys all over the place. I don't think I'm the person to do that. And yet God said, go over there where those chariots are and go do the thing. So I'm walking by faith because I know God's always been with me. And even if I fail, it's where he called me to be. That's a hard thing to do though. And it's easy to forget all the times that God showed up. I know I've talked with all of you. Some of you have told me stories about writing your last few dollars to give to the church because that's what you were called to do. And yet money came in from unexpected places. You've told me about hard times where it was hard to serve God and you did it because God showed up anyway, right? And you knew that he was going to do that. But it is so easy to forget all of those times and just cave to that fear and that pressure. And when we do, we end up where we didn't want to be. We end up just like these people and judges under oppression and needing God to come and rescue us because we strayed off our hiking trail into nowhere and we're sure we're going to die, right? So that brings us back to our main point this morning. In our faith journey with Jesus, we need to remember that small disobedience can lead to big consequences, but God is always pursuing us even in our waywardness. 
Again, small compromises take us further and further away from Jesus. It's not about failure. We know that we're not going to do it perfectly, right? We know that we can't do it perfectly. But this is rather about disobedience and unrepentance. So just like when we get lost hiking, if we stop and we turn back and we say, God, I made a mistake. He's right there to forgive us, right? He's our God of second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh chances. If you don't believe me, read the book of Judges. We'll see over and over again how many chances he gives these people to be faithful and they're not. And that's okay because he's still there with them. He still has pity and mercy on them. We also see that God doesn't abandon these people no matter how far they strayed because he promised, made a promise to them. And that's true of us as well. Now, that's not something we should bank on. We shouldn't say, well, God's always going to take me back. So I'm going to go do these things. That's the wrong heart. And God judges our heart. And yet, when we find ourselves lost in the woods nine miles off the trail, when we're dead sure that nobody's looking for us, God comes walking through the woods to bring us back. As long as we are willing to admit where we went wrong and come back to him, right? I don't know about you, but that's really reassuring to me because I am a complete bonehead. I mess up a lot. And I'm sure that all of you can echo that sentiment as well. I think we can see as we explore this book of Judges that God sees around corners that we couldn't see. And while it doesn't seem like a big deal to us in the moment, it's because God sees a mile down the road how much that's going to be a problem for me later. And he still lets us choose. He lets us make the choice, right? He doesn't force us. He told the people, drive out all the people of Canaan. There was a good reason for that, because they're going to fall into idolatry if they don't. It's going to take them away from God if they don't. And yet, they didn't listen. They didn't do the things. We do that too. And I think the other thing we need to realize is that God is going to be with us, but we're going to go through the consequences of those choices too. He lets us make the choice. Even though a mile down the road, it's going to hurt. He'll walk through us with that hurt, but there are consequences for the things we choose too. And that's what we'll see in the book of Judges as well. There are consequences and they suffer these consequences all throughout the book. Um, for the choices they made by not being faithful. Now, God wants us to avoid these pitfalls. He doesn't want us to travel down the road a mile and encounter that bad thing. That's why he told us to be obedient in the first place. He didn't want the Israelites to suffer through this period of time, but they chose it. They chose not to be obedient. And he said, okay, so this is what's going to happen. Because you chose this, I'm going to use it to grow you and teach you and test you. So remember, when we hit obstacles and we fail, God's going to use those in the same way to test us and grow us and stretch us. He doesn't leave us in them, but we may have to go through hard things because of bad choices, right? So how do we avoid some of this? Well, spending time in prayer and meditating upon his word is a great way to hear his voice, to not go around that corner that I shouldn't go around. See, when we spend time with him and we soak in his word and we listen to his voice, we will find in those moments where he calls us to something, they'll be far less challenging. If I know that he's been with the Israelites and he took them out of Egypt and he did all these miracles just to save this group of people and establish them as a nation. If Jesus came, the son of God, God embodied in the flesh and came and lived a perfect life and died on the cross in my place for my sin and was raised to life and he performed all these miracles, well, surely I can go talk to that person that God's prompting me to talk to, right? When I soak myself in that, when I remember those things that God did and does and calls us to do, it's so much easier in that moment. It doesn't take away the fear, but it makes it easier to obey, right? So that's why we've put an emphasis in our church on doing these things, and we ask each other to do that together, right? Equally as important, uh, if and when, and yes, I'm saying when we fail, when we are feckless, let us not be afraid to come to God on our knees. Repentance is so important. Confession is so important when we, when we make a mistake. 
We can't just weep. We can't just be broken by our choices. That's good. But we have to repent. We have to commit to going a different way. And even though we may fail again, we want to commit to going in a different direction and trying to do something different. So let us confess and ask for his help and his guidance when we fail. When we do that, we're going to find a loving father waiting to walk alongside of us and lift us back onto our feet. Musicians, if you want to come up, I'm just going to invite you guys to pray with me before we finish out our service this morning. <clears throat>